Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes, the podcast where we give our immediate reactions to the hottest board games just minutes after playing them. My name's Tim. And I'm Chris. This is Adam. And we're going to give our hot takes on the game that we just finished playing, Underwater Cities. As always, I'm going to give a brief description of the game and then we'll jump in with our thoughts. In Underwater Cities, you live in the near future where the planet is overpopulated, resources are scarce, and humanity has to find new places to expand. The vast, untapped ocean is the answer, and players will compete to build the most valuable underwater nation. On your turn, you'll place one of your three action tiles on an action space on the board and get the related benefits, but you also have to discard a card from your hand at the same time, and if the card you discard matches one of the three colors, red, green, or orange, of the action spaces you covered, then you also get the benefit on the card you discarded. The actions on the board and many of the cards are going to give you resources or let you convert those resources to build out pieces of your underwater cities, including domed cities, tunnels to connect the cities, or special buildings that will give you production or end game benefits. Some of the cards you discard to take an action will also be added to your tableau to give you additional production, ongoing benefits, or end game points based on certain criteria. After all players have placed all three of their action tiles, the round ends. The game is played over 10 rounds with the production phase happening after the 4th, 7th, and 10th rounds. After the final production phase, players will receive additional points from the number of cities they've built and the number of unique buildings attached to them by converting leftover resources to points and by meeting conditions on scoring cards in their tableau. The player with the most points wins. Underwater Cities was designed by Vladimir Suchi and published by Rio Grande Games. Let's jump into our thoughts. Now, before we start talking about the mechanisms, I did want to mention we did also play with uh, the new Discoveries expansion tonight, and um, we just played with a couple modules. One of them was a quick start module, which gives each player a little bit of an asymmetric start on their starting resources, as well as an ongoing action ability they can use throughout the course of the game. And then we also had all of the, um, the additional cards, so a little bit more variety in the card decks. For each of the eras um, that came from the expansion. So just a couple things uh, that were added from the expansion there. It didn't change the game too much. Just wanted to bring that up for this play and our thoughts on it. So let's talk about the mechanisms and let's start with uh, Adam tonight. Adam, what's a, what's a mechanism here that you found interesting or, or worth uh, you know discussing? Starting in broad strokes, it's kind of a worker placement. And then with, with some card play added in there. And the part that kind of is the hook for me is the matching your worker placement with a color to the same color card in your hand and try to combo those up and match those up to get your maximum efficiency. So uh, around the board, you probably said it, Tim, in your intro. I, I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> there's, the, there's, I guess it's a yellow or orangey color and then red and then green on one side. And you have the three colors of cards too. So you want to give yourself options. So it's kind of decision space and then limiting decision space with the, the card colors in your hand, because it, it'll limit you to one or two sides of the board if you don't have that third color card in your hand. That's a mechanism I like. I don't know how, I'm not saying it eloquently or anything, but I like having your decision space kind of eliminated a little bit. Now you still have the option to go to a color of a card you don't have, but you're losing some efficiency in your turn. So I like that mechanic where, and I'm gonna say it again, your the cards in your hand kind of limit your options to where you can place your worker out there on the board. Yeah, I think that's what really makes us stand out from a traditional worker placement game, because that's really what it is. I mean, it, it, they don't use workers like most games do. Instead, they use these little, um, they call them action tiles in the rule book, but they basically, I think they're supposed to represent doorways so that when you cover up an action space, it's like a closed door, a really dumb representation of, of uh, blocking that space, but that's what they used. And um, But it, you know, really, it's, it's a traditional worker placement um, style game, except for that, that card comboing. And that's really the thing that makes this game stand out. And I think what really makes it the most fun, it always feels like you're going to do two very unique actions. Now the action spaces on the board don't change too much. So there's like, you know, in a four player game, like 12 action spaces you can use, but the cards, it's a huge deck of cards and the cards, it's three separate decks. So after each production phase, you switch to a different deck in the game. And so it's a huge variety in cards. And so you're always doing something that's fun it's a mix. You're comboing stuff off of each other. Yeah, that mix and, and trying to find that the, the right card, the card that you need right now to match the action space you need right now is awesome. And it also makes the worker placement, the blocking on those spaces more meaningful because 
with a traditional worker placement space. Yeah, someone can block you, but maybe you take a different action. But sometimes they're going to block you and then like, hey, now I don't even have any cards I can use in my hand. So I'm, I'm not only going to have to take an action I don't like as much, but I'm also going to have to take an action and not get a benefit from the card that I was going to play. It just really ele- you know, elevates the, the whole concept of worker placement and makes it more interesting decisions there. What about you, Chris? Uh, anything on that you want to add or, or you want to jump into a different mechanism? I do want to talk about that, but let me back off to like the 100,000 foot level for a second and say, you know, it's hard to talk about this game without also talking about and comparing it with Terraforming Mars. Because there are a lot of things about this that are conceptually similar, you know, terraforming Mars, terraforming the ocean floor is probably the wrong word, but there's a lot of things about these these two games that really kind of you know that that come to mind. And one thing that I do like is that worker placement aspect, which is a lot more uh, interactive than it is the sort of the equivalent mechanisms in terraforming Mars. And I think the real fun in that is the player interaction. I mean, you could tell throughout our game tonight, people were actively trying to block each other in ways that were incredibly satisfying. It was... Uh, <laughs> Tim, <is> just, <laughs> Tim would disagree. He's like looking demoralized. Over <laughs> but I mean, but for real, I mean, it's, you know, we talk all the time about player interaction makes for a fun game. And this, and this does that. Uh, so in that sense, I like, I like the aspect of it, the, um, the more traditional worker placement aspect. You know, I actually, when I was thinking through how I was going to comment on that whole color-coded card thing, (laughs) I actually was going to say I didn't like it. But the more you guys talked about it, the more I realized it actually does add a really interesting element to the game. And I think if they had been more heavy-handed with it, I think it could have been a problem. But But they weren't. It limits your decision space a little bit, but it's not like you frequently find yourself going, you know, damn, I can't find the right card to play here. It's dramatically changing the things that I can do. So it it does create some subtle shifts in strategy, but I don't think it beats you down too much. And I think with that in mind, it does add a nice little, uh, a nice little touch to it that keeps you on your toes. I do enjoy that. The, uh, Back to the color-coded card thing, almost reminds me a little bit of brass where you have the cards in your hand and that gives you your options as to where you can play or do an action. Yeah, that's that's a good uh, a good point as well. Uh, one of the other cool things about the, the cards matching with the colors on the board is that the colors of the actions on the board are different strengths. So the green actions, which are down at the bottom of the board, are kind of the weakest actions. The red actions on the, the side, on the left side of the board, are a little bit more powerful. And then the orange actions across the top are generally the most powerful. So, for example, at the bottom of the board, there's a space where you can just get a just get one tunnel. Where at the top of the board on the orange one, you can get two tunnels, you know, so there, there's a clear higher value based on the color that you're kind of placing your action marker in. But then with the cards, it's the opposite. So green cards tend to be the most powerful, red kind of medium and orange, the least powerful. So it's really neat because depending, you know, like when you combo those two cards together, you're generally going to get about the same experience as you would no matter where you are. They may not always be the right experience for that time or, you know, based on the, the strategy you're trying to build up. I think it's cool how they balance that out, you know, so you don't feel like, hey, I've got a handful of orange cards. They're super powerful and I'm going to I'm going to win based on that, because the fact is you're going to be trying to use them on or rather, let's say if it was the green cards. Right. But you're going to be using them on less powerful actions. So I think that's uh, that's really neat. And then one other thing I want to mention just about that before we jump over to Chris's terraforming Mars conversation, because I have some other thoughts there. The one other thing is that it does it just like um we talked about in Castles of Burgundy in our last episode. One of the things that makes Castles of Burgundy work pretty well is that you are restricted. There's a lot of things you can do, but you're restricted by the actions, right? And Adam mentioned it already that the cards help restrict what your actions are. And this game has a lot of pretty meaty decisions and a lot of planning that goes into it, but it's shocking. We played a four player game and we ran through it pretty briskly, you know, and it's 10 rounds. So it's like 30 actions per player, like I said, some pretty complex actions. So aside from one or two turns where someone was kind of stalled trying to figure out exactly what they were going to do, everyone took their turns fairly quickly. And I think that's partly driven by the color, you know, the kind of the color matching thing, because, hey, if I really want to get this one action, if I really need to build a building um, or a city, for example, I'm going to look at the two spaces on the board that let me do that. And then I'm going to find, okay, the only the only the orange one is left. Okay, great. Now, what orange card do I have in my hand? 
right? And it's, it's, it immediately kind of restricts your ch- choices. Or if I just have three red cards in my hand, well, I'm not even looking at the green or orange action spaces this time. I'm just going to look at the, or- the red action spaces. So it, it really pulls those decisions down. But like Chris said, it doesn't force you, right? If you really need to take an action on the board, just take that action. You can, even if you don't get a benefit off the card, sometimes you need to do that to, to meet something before production or to try to beat someone else to that space. So it, you, you get the flexibility, but because the, the benefits that you get by comboing those colors together, it, it kind of forces you in a direction that helps you make some decisions a little bit quicker. And I think that's always important it, it, with a reasonably heavy game. You know, downtime can be a real a bear, and and this I didn't feel like that tonight. I, I I almost really felt like I would get done with my turn, and I didn't even have a chance to go run to the restroom or you know go go get a drink without stalling because by the time I got back, you guys had already whipped through your turns. So that's pretty nice in a game like this. Yeah, I was surprised at how how briskly the game moved along, which is is really nice. It is nice. Uh, now, Chris, you mentioned terraforming Mars, and I think underwater cities gets compared a lot, it, probably for a couple of reasons. One that one of the things you can do with the cards you're discarding sometimes is put them into a tableau. So instead of just getting an immediate benefit, they might go into a tableau that you can either trigger later, things like that. So that, obviously, that's a lot like terraforming Mars. The other being that there's you know you're building something out you know away from your hand and stuff, but in this case, you're building on your own player board. In this, in the case of terraforming Mars. You're ba- building on the main board. So I wanted to touch on that first and that you, you mentioned that this has more player interaction with the uh, the work replacement space, right? But from the the board development space, Terraforming Mars does have more player interaction than this. Underwater cities, when you're building out your, your board, other than people kind of watching what you're trying to do and maybe trying to block the actions that you're trying to get, you don't really get to... Um, you know, get too engaged with what other people are doing on their board. So that's a little bit of a, um, I think, un- maybe a, a little bit of an unfortunate thing. I think it would be kind of, would have been kind of neat if there was some other more, you know, interaction on the, on the actual city building part of it. Yeah, I agree, Tim. That'd be, uh, that's kind of a neat idea. Just, you know, uh, off the cusp, just have a, a shared board in the middle where you're trying to develop your city in a limited space against the other players it might be kind of cool. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, it, so it's, it's a difference, but it, it's something I think that I can see why it's comparable. The other thing when you're comparing it to terraforming Mars and the tableau building part of it, you know, terraforming Mars is really all about those cards, the, the, the tableau, the, this one tonight, like for example, I didn't, I ended up with like one production card and a couple end game scoring cards. I definitely did not build up the type of tableau I like to, I would prefer to. And so it's a little less dependent on that. So it's a fun element of both games, I think, but it's not it's not quite the same. You know, I had heard the comparisons. You can see the comparison in the mechanisms. But when I played Underwater Cities, I don't feel like I'm playing Terraforming Mars. So just for people that, are, you know, if you know Terraforming Mars, and you're like, I don't want a game that's the same. I don't think you're going to feel that this is the same. I think that there is enough, or maybe if you didn't like Terraforming Mars, this is really a different gameplay experience, even though it has some of the same elements as Terraforming Mars does. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would definitely agree that that's it, you do not feel like you're playing the same game, even though there, there's some, definitely some some similarities there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Adam, anything uh, anything else you wanted to touch on with mechanisms? I agree on that point that uh, you know I have I played Terraforming Mars many many times, and this gives me a very different feel than Terraforming Mars. I do want to talk about the player interaction piece. So there is that part of the worker the worker placement, maybe you're watching other people's boards and trying to anticipate what spot they might be going for or going for one of those in-game scoring cards. So there can be kind of a race or a battle for those in-game scoring cards, or you can, you know, kind of block somebody out, get there. So that's kind of a neat aspect too. And that's another, another small piece of the player. Maybe it's large, depending on how you, you look at it. Another piece of the player interaction is, but that's really those spots, the worker placement spots, and then grabbing, going for those in-game pieces or uh, racing to the angry secretary pieces are kind of the main player interaction pieces, unless I'm missing something. What do you guys think? No, I think that's, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's worker placement and that's where most of your interaction comes in a, in a Euro game like this, where the action selection is just about choosing the right action at the right time. But I think it works well. Uh, you know, again, there was a lot of moments here where I finished my turn and said, please, you guys, I, you know, I just hope that out of the 12 spaces left, you know, you guys don't take the one space that I need. And most of the time you did, you know, so there's definitely may having to make the decision about which space you're taking now, because the next one, it might not be available to you, you know, when it comes back around to you is pretty important in this game. Racing for the, uh, um, they're essentially like bonus cards. So if you're the first one to get something done in the game, 
uh, for example, like building three symbiotic symbiotic cities. Yeah. If you like the one we had tonight, if you built three symbiotic cities, then you would get, get this bonus card off the board and you'd get be the first one to get some benefits from it. In that case, some points and a credit. Adam got to one where if you built three upgraded tunnels first, then he would get some, you know, some benefit for it. That's fun too. It kind of drives you to, you know, multiple people trying to do the same thing at the same time. And be just because I think the the pace of the game the way it develops, you, people tend to be getting to that level about the same time if they're working towards them. So it's never like, okay, well, there's just three of those cards out. I managed to get it done and nobody else even cared about it. It's typically like two people are within a turn of, you know, one of those cards before they actually gets hit. So it's a it's a fun little race mechanism. But I, I what I started to say was that is not um, like a core game mechanism. It's not, you know, it's in the base game, but they don't even recommend playing with it, you know, at the beginning game. It's kind of like they call it an advanced module. So it's not that complicated or anything like that, but um, I think it adds a a fun little extra variable into the game. Yeah, it's a nice piece. Chris, anything else? Uh, No, I think that'll do it. Okay. The one other, one last thing I'll mention, I mentioned already that the, the decks of cards that you're playing with, when you start the game, there's a, a big old stack of cards. It's the Arrow One deck. So you shuffle that all up and you know those are the cards you're you're dealing with every every turn. And then you move into the Arrow Two and then it's completely different cards. But it, I think it really helps the flow of the game because the intro cards, they tend to be more about quick resources and things like that. Stuff that helps you build your engine at the start. You get into the middle round and they're a little bit more dependent. Like, hey, if you happen to have these two buildings, then you're going to get a bigger benefit for it. And then in the final round, a lot of those cards are going to be kind of end game scoring benefits. So it's kind of nice that you don't just end up with a pile of cards at the beginning that are not going to benefit you at all. I think that was smart that they split that into three different decks uh, instead of combining them all together. All right, cool. So I think that covers the mechanisms pretty well. Uh, there, there's a couple more things I'll probably touch on when we start to talk about specific moments in the game, but from a mechanism perspective, we're in good shape. Uh, so let's jump into the production of the game. Adam, what, what did you think of the production of Underwater Cities? We were on the TTS mod tonight, and I've never actually handled the physical game, but from what I understand, if looking at the game on Board Game Geek, it looks amazing. You got the little pop matic bubbles for your cities, all your little buildings around your cities. They're nice kind of transparent discs, it looks like. It looks like there's some upgrades you get a hold of too. The art is fantastic. So from a production standpoint, from what I from my limited knowledge, it, it looks pretty good. Yeah, it's it's not bad. I like it's a very colorful game. It's got a really nice presence on the table. I always like to look at it. It is a lot of cardboard typically. So you do have those nice plastic domes for your cities. That's nice out of the box. And then the little building discs, like you mentioned, are little transparent discs of different colors. So it's a nice tactile, you know, feel. They're very tiny. They're hard to handle kind of. You're trying to stack up these little discs uh, with the physical copy and it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's okay. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty nice components from that perspective. Other than that, you end up with a lot of cardboard. All the resource tokens are just little cardboard shits and the, um, the action markers are cardboard shits. So nothing too special there. I, I did upgrade. So like my physical copy, I went to board game geek has their geek up bits for the resources. And then they just released some metal coins for it. And they're, they're, those are awesome components. So obviously not necessary, but if you, if you want something more than just Cardboard shits, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Chris, I've, I've got a couple more things to say about production, but Chris, anything that you that strikes you from a production perspective? Well, I just love that Adam called them the uh, Popomatic uh, domes because <laughs> ho- hopefully uh, people actually understand what that means. So anybody who's played, was it Sorry? And I love it. From Trouble from back in the days. Yeah, yeah, Trouble, Trouble. Um, actually, I-, I wanted to touch on the art a little bit because I, <laughs> I, so. I, I started this game going, man, you know, the art, it's okay. I really enjoy good art. But this one, honestly, it, the more I looked at it, the more I enjoyed it because there's definitely some gravitas to it. It's kind, it's colorful, like Tim said, but it's not cartoony for the most part. And there's some things in there that are pretty goofy. Like, you know, you kind of look at it and you go, man, you know, like this one card I had, it was a guy wearing like a pastel suit. It just, it kind of looked goofy. Um, but there are some that just laugh out loud funny. Like there's this one with a propaganda card where you uh, you have somebody who has like a, a Uncle Sam, I want you poster that has a, a diving bell over their head. And so it's, you know, it just, it's funny, funny stuff on some of those. Uh, but at the same time, they also have a lot of cards where the art is is very kind of dark, like you would expect underwater, um, uh, the underwater world to be. 
And the more I the more I looked at the art closely as we were playing through the game, the more I found myself being drawn into the world of this game. And I, I think that's an amazing thing for art to do when you're playing a game like this. So you know, hats off to the the artist for this. And like I said it took me a few minutes, but once I got there, I was I was all in. I'm yeah. I'm totally with you, Chris. Sorry, Tim. I, just real quick. At first, I was like, the art didn't do much, but the more you look at these cards, they're just they're just fun and they're kind of whimsical and neat. Like what Steve had someone, or there's like a giant sea cockroach looking in this little <laughs> sub window or something. I don't know. They're just they're just pretty cool. Yeah, I I think that that's where a lot of the really all the theme comes into the game. I mean, obviously you've got theme in building out your underwater city, and that's a very you know visual. It it, it puts you right in that spot. But the the card art is really what builds the world, and they do a pretty neat job with it here. You know, it's near futuristic, so you you have a lot of things that are kind of like what you'd expect. You know, people on ski doos and you know people in boardrooms. But there's little flares that you, that tell you they're in the future, like the styles of the clothing that people are wearing. And then there's some like technology that you know doesn't exist today. Like I had a, a card that was a production card that was electric eels. And basically it showed these little electric eels with little cables plugged into them. And so if you had labs, you'd get to produce additional resources. So the idea that they're using these underwater resources and doing something with it and kind of putting a sci-fi slant on it, you know, some, some of it even goes into the absurd. Like I had one of my assistant cards was like a shark with a helmet on it. And, and I know another one is like a giant octopus and, you know, Steve's was like a AI, like graphical entity. So, you know, it, it gets into it a little bit of absurd, but that that adds some flavor and adds a little bit of fun to it. Yeah, for sure. The, the only complaint I have about the art, I think, and, and it's not just the art, it's it's also just the... So, okay, so think of Terraforming Mars again as a comparison, how every single card in the entire deck is different, right? Every single one. And so the art is not great there. I definitely prefer the underwater cities art and look and feel and stuff, but everything is different in Terraforming Mars. Well, in this one, there is a lot of duplicated cards. They tend to not be exact duplicate benefits, but they're close. I just don't enjoy as much seeing, oh, like I just I just discarded that card and now I drew the same one up, you know, and there's there's plenty of variety. Don't get me wrong. It's fine. But that's the only complaint I have is that I think if they would have just kind of, you know, taken it to the next level and taken that 50 or so cards out that are just duplicates and put some more unique stuff in there, it would have even been more flavorful and fun and unique. I don't know, man. That's very, that's very yeah. nitpicky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's legit though. It's, that's a legitimate complaint, but I agree. It's not, it's not a huge one. It's not a huge one. And usually when they have similar art, it's because the card has a similar effect. It's yeah. like the same kind of mission or you're trading in some similar kind of resource or it's an era one card and an era two card yeah. that are just slightly different slightly different in their power yeah no i i totally agree with that it is nitpicky and w what we played with tonight again was a more variety in cards because we were playing with the expansion cards if you're playing just the base game and you've played it a few times you tend to see a lot of the same cards over and over again so i definitely don't feel it as much playing with the expansion which i definitely recommend it's, it's a great expansion but yeah, that's that's all. I think when you're playing with the base game, you tend to see a lot of the same cards over again. It gets a little bit boring. You know, it's just not not as fun. So my minor thing. Other than that, uh, the only other one thing I really want to call out on the product. Well, a couple things on the production. I guess one is those action markers. I, I so stupid. I don't know what they were thinking to just put these little like they're just little cardboard chits and they look like a hallway with a door in them. And it's just you know not thematic it's not interesting like one of the upgrades you can find online is somebody put little um player colored little submarines that you could put out on the board i don't know i mean it's just got an underwater theme like what you're actually doing isn't thematic anyway by placing an action marker on the board and getting a benefit so you know who cares give it i don't know make the components something nicer but just every time i've ever taught the game someone's like what is this thing supposed to be and it's i don't have any idea what it's supposed to be so <clears throat> that's a again it's a fairly minor complaint but it's it's annoying. That one is nitpicky, but so legit for me. I'm. It's just a weird rectangle. You're like putting these weird. Yeah. I, you can't even like grab it. Like, give me something that I can at least has some height. I can grab it and set it somewhere. You know, I here I am. Yeah. I've never played the game in real life, but <laughs> you have to. I could see. I can imagine the physics. You'd have to. You kind of fumble it around to grab this little cardboard thing. Make it like you know a little pond or something, or a little sea, sea deep sea diver or something, so you could put them out there. Yeah. Yeah. If, if even if it's a traditional worker placement game, like the idea, the concept that you're going and you know sending somebody to do something instead of just closing the door after they've done the thing, <laughs> just put a worker out there to mark that that's been done already. Like it's even just using traditional worker placement, I think would have just worked a little bit better. 
So yeah, it's it's minor, but until you said it was a door, I didn't realize it. Was See, I know, right? For, just, for what it's worth, just like I, I, and I think it's a door. I'm not even positive. It's about confusing. That. Like when you were teaching it, you're right, Tim. When you were teaching it to me, I was like, "What? It's I don't. What is this thing? It's <laughs> it's, a, it's a rectangle that I put up." <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Last thing is uh, just from a user experience perspective, I think it's pretty good. Um, the cards are are well laid out. Uh, you know, rarely once you've taught somebody kind of main action spaces on the board, are there any real questions that come up during the course of the game from iconography or anything like that? So I think it's pretty good. It's nice that the cards, just like Terraforming Mars, do spell out what what every card does. So when you play it, if, if you don't recognize the iconography, just look down at the bottom of the card and it tells you exactly what it does. That's really nice. Uh, I don't understand why they put the action spaces around the edge of the board. I guess it's fine when you're playing around the table, you have everyone's got kind of facing different action spaces. Uh, but that seemed like a weird board layout to me. Like I, I feel like it would have, I don't know, just made more sense to kind of have the, the spaces more centrally located instead of just on the edges. So I'm not sure why they did that. It's not, not a big deal, but it's minor. Um, anything else with production, you guys? Yeah, I just want to... Um... I just want to differ slightly on the iconography. I did not find it nearly as uh, clear as you did. Okay. Uh, but I've also only played it twice. So, you know, I, I maybe if I'd played it more times, it would come to me quicker. But I found myself struggling with it a bunch of times and had to ask a lot of questions. In the end, it was another one of those things that wasn't a huge complaint, but, you know, it it made it a little bit more rocky for me. Okay, fair enough, Chris. I can see that. Maybe it is because I've, I've played it quite a bit more. So thanks for your hot take on that after just plays. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, let's jump into our next question. Um, what was your favorite moment of the game tonight? Chris, why don't you start us off? <laughs> I normally try to think of something somebody uh, somebody else did that was really cool. But this one, um, there was one point in the game where there was one space that like, everybody on that board needed and Tim desperately needed. And all you, all you had to do, and we were down to the end of the round, and all we needed to do was get to be, you know, the first person to go in the next round. And I just happened to have one card completely unrelated, you know, to the spot on the board that would allow you to get first player. But I had a card that just by chance had that on it. And I was able to throw that card down, get that first player and get whatever number of points it was that, that I got for putting that last, uh, that last uh, dome down and, Man, did that feel good! I don't, I don't get to do that too often, <laughs> especially at Tim. Tim usually uh, takes my button these things, and that one, that just, that felt good. Well, I'm, I'm just glad that you didn't only beat me by four points. The four points that you got from that <laughs> bonus action at the end of the game, or it would have made it even more painful. Um, yeah, that was frustrating. Uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll like that. There's a couple moments today where I just didn't plan quite right, and I think that's actually one of the things about this game. It is a, it's very tight, and you. You know, there's a lot you can do in a turn. You can combo a card with an action and get all kinds of stuff, but you still have to plan out both collecting the resources you need and being able to build with the resources. And you're trying to get it done before the production phase happens because, you know, that's, of course, where you're going to get all the resources for the next era. And um, a couple, a couple, I think if that and one other action I'd taken, I just had the one extra coin I needed in both in both cases to do what I needed, I probably would have won the game because I, I missed out on like, I had like six points from a production because of one coin I was short before my final action. And then I missed because I didn't have the one coin I needed to get, get that last building built before the first player token, that same thing happened. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just piggyback on that. Chris is that was my moments of the game tonight. Just, you know, feeling that, Oh, can I get this done? If I, if I can just do the right thing, I'll have just enough resources to do it. And I didn't quite get there. It's fun to try to puzzle that out and get it figured out. Frustrating when it doesn't work, but this is not a bad frustrating. Mm -hmm. Like as much as I swore at you tonight, um, it, it, it's not the type of frustrating that I felt, for example, when we played Eclipse, you know, like I was mentioning frustration from Eclipse where you can really get like beat down in the game and in you, you may not come back or it doesn't feel like you can. That's not like this at all. It's, it's more tactical frustrations, but it's a fun, a fun, tight little puzzle. Yeah. And it says something about the, uh, the player interaction as well the, yeah. that, that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Adam? Any uh, fun, any, any moments that stood out to you tonight? There's a, there's a few things I want to touch on. First was Chris's play tonight. I thought it was outstanding. Seeing him sneak that, that in-game bonus from Tim, like you guys already talked about, that was cool. And then I thought I had an in-game scoring for like 12 points. I checked it like, I don't know, two rounds, two you know rounds before the final scoring round. <laughs> and I looked up and, I'm, oh, man, I'm 
I'm sitting pretty. I have like six tunnels that are upgraded. No one's going to come close to this. And then I go to score it and everybody else is like, no, dude, Chris has like eight tunnels that are upgraded. What are you thinking? You don't get any points for that. So that's just my fault for not looking around, not looking up or paying attention. Um, but Chris was all over it, making all the right moves tonight. So it was fun to watch you to watch you do that. And then we're talking about frustrating moments too. So maybe that's a sign of a game that you really enjoy is how much you enjoy the frustrating times. So for me, this game does get a little bit a little bit frustrating. I feel like I can't always quite get to do the thing I want to do. I know that's a staple of some of these Euro games, but I just, I don't have it figured out yet. And I do enjoy the puzzle of it, but I always feel like, uh, you know, a day late and dollar short to use a horrible cliche. All right. Sounds good. Um, so would you request to play the game again, Adam? Why don't you just uh, jump right in there? I, you know, having just said that, I would request to play it again because it's fun. I feel like this puzzle is very solvable. There are some frustrating moments, but I feel like I can claw and climb and get over the hump and figure out this game. And I don't want to say master it, at least feel like I planned ahead and paid attention to what everybody else was doing and get to that point where I make some nice moves and get all the points and win the game and get the ladies and <laughs> spray champagne over everything. And- <laughs> all right. Um, Chris, what, what about you? What? By, by ladies, I don't know if he means the angry underwater receptionist, who's so uh, <laughs> one, one of our favorite cards in the game. Um, no, I, I, you know, I think I would. I was a little skeptical at first. I'd only played it once before tonight, and I, I think I was a slow learner on it, so I was, I was a little skeptical about it. But honestly, after playing it, I had a lot of fun tonight. I liked the player interaction. I liked the puzzle of it. I like, I actually like the, uh, the player board, you know, the, the combination of the interaction in the central board and the kind of the you know, individual puzzle in your player board. And I think that that works really, really nicely together. And, you know, I can't underestimate the degree to which it's nice to have a game that moves along briskly. I mean, we have games, we'll sit, we'll play a game of Eclipse. I love Eclipse, but man, that game is going to be a four or five hour game, it seems like. You know, this game, it moves along nicely, but it still feels like it has that the weight to it of a good, you know, solid, complex game. And I really appreciate that. Cool. I um, I love Underwater Cities, and I will definitely be requesting to play it some more. Um, I probably played it about a dozen times or so, and I've taught it to five or six different people, and I've barely won it, um, which is, you know, this is usually my type of game. So I'm not sure why I can't quite figure it out. But to be honest, I think it's because I'm just having so much fun like doing the tactical turn to turn decisions that I just don't even, you know, like I care, you know, right. I'm trying to build up a strategy and do something, but I'm not, I'm usually more interested in just doing the fun combos and getting something big on a turn than I am about really like making sure that I'm optimizing every point. And, and that's okay. I still, I've, I've had fun every single play I've had of this, but I often teach it to new people and lose to them, um, which is not, you know, that's not that common to do. So I think, you know, that says a lot about how much I like the game. The the one other thing I'll mention is that when I first saw the game and, and played it the first couple of times, I was a little worried that the, you know, what you're doing, you basically have the same shape of player board every time. So you're kind of building out the same type, you know, the same buildings in the same city. And I was worried that that was going to get stale and tiresome. And it really hasn't. And I, I think going back to the fact that you just have so much variety in the cards you're doing, that even though you're kind of generally trying to build towards the same actions, it doesn't really feel the same every time. So if anyone else has those those worries, I would just say, uh, at least for me, it hasn't gotten tired, you know, even after the number of plays I've done at this point. So I will definitely be uh, asking to play this again. I also think it plays great at two, three, and four players and also has a really fun solo mode, by the way, one that has very little upkeep, but still feels like you're playing against a real opponent. But even at two players, you flip the board over and it's a little bit tighter board with less action spaces. So uh, even at two players, I think it works better than a lot of worker placement games do. Still a really fun experience. So, um, all right, great. Well, I think that wraps up our conversation for Underwater Cities. jump into our final question and that is is there anything you're excited about in gaming this week and if you guys don't mind i'll go ahead and start this one off because i have one i'm really excited to talk about uh there's a game that is just coming out right now i think you can you can probably buy it now but it basically just got released it's a a game called whistle mountain 
and it's designed by Luke Laurie, and it is, um, I think it's published by Bezier Games. The reason this kind of uh, caught my attention, it probably wouldn't have otherwise, but you've heard me talking about The Dwellings of Eldervale the last few weeks. It's a game I'm really excited about, should be coming from Kickstarter soon. Well, that was also a Luke Laurie design. So, um, you know, I follow him, him on social media, and he's been talking about his two big games that are coming out right now. I went ahead and, and paid attention to it. I think it's co-designed by Scott Caputo, who is um, known for a lot of tile placement types of games, a lot of uh, really interesting designs on tile placement. Uh, but what this ultimately is, is it is another worker placement game, but it's got a really interesting blend of worker placement. Oh, I don't know. It's it's In a lot of ways, it's kind of like we were talking about uh, interaction and you know how you're doing something that, Adam, your idea of what you could potentially do with a, a blended player board on Underwater Cities, this does that. Like basically, I, don't, I can't even get into explaining all the mechanisms, but there's an idea of where you're taking polyamino tiles and building them out of the main board. And that's essentially building out your worker placement spots. And your workers are different types of airships, like a blimp and a dirigible and a big, huge airship. And so when you place that airship out on the board, depending on all the different resources it's connected to, that's the benefit you get. And then there's some like engine pieces that go up there. It looks like just such a fun mix of, you know, resource management and worker placement and tableau building. And there's some engine building in it. Like you can add uh, upgrades to your ships on your board and everything just seems to fit together really well. And the re- the early reviews on it have been fantastic. So I'm super excited about that one. Uh, definitely check it out. I will, uh, I'll probably be picking that one up. I think, I think it's going to be a good hit for me. Uh, so what about you, Chris, anything new this week for you? Yeah, I'm going to be getting my copy of uh, Marvel United, which was published by Simon and designed by Andrea Chiravicio and Eric Lang. I'm a huge Eric Lang fan. And uh, this game I've actually been excited about for a while. And it just happened that the game came to my house right after I moved out of California. And so it's been uh, it sat there in the house for a while with the folks who uh, who moved in after me. Who, who very graciously held on to the game for me and passed it off to a friend of mine. And now, finally, uh, I've landed in Santa Fe, New Mexico for long enough that I can have have something sent out to me. And, and so now I'm able to get it. So hopefully this week, I will actually be getting that in my hot little hands and will uh, get a chance to sit down and play it. And I'm really looking forward to this game because it looks like a lot of fun. It's uh, It's a co-op game sort of medium weight, but it's got a lot of superheroes in it. I think that's a lot of fun. And uh, it's a very graphically interesting game and I'm, I'm psyched to play it. So uh, it's been a long time coming, but it should finally be here. Are you getting all the uh, expansion and like add-on content that you got in the Kickstarter too, or is this just the base game? Uh, I think at this point, it's just the base game. Okay. Uh, one of the frustrating things about the way that they did this, this campaign was that you had to choose uh, to either get the you you get it all shipped together but if you wanted to ship together you had to wait until everything came out or you had to ship it separately and pay shipping twice which was uh, a little frustrating but i didn't want to wait of course i'm i'm waiting anyway but uh, but this should be just a base game. Yeah, Simon is not known for their, or Kaman, or however they're pronounced. I was not known for their the, treating their Kickstarter customers very well. Like they, you know, they put out really big, extravagant products. But that type of thing, you know, I think can be really frustrating. In fact, with Marvel United, I, you know, what I heard is even if you kickstarted it, got the base game on the Kickstarter, so you paid a year in advance for it or whatever, you could go pick it up in Target about two, a month or two months before yep. you could even, you know, get it yourself. It was Walmart, one of the big box stores. And that's like, like that is just the worst thing you could possibly do to your customers who, you know, they not only put the money up front and helped you make the game, they invested way up in advance. Just get them the game first. Don't put it into a store where anyone else can get it. All it does is, you know, make them upset about the whole process. So, Amen, dude. Yeah, that's frustrating. All right, uh, Adam, what about you? Well, first, I want to say it looks like that Whistle Mountain has a Tabletopia implementation. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, let's, let's bust it out soon. Yeah, okay, we got to do that soon. So that looks, that looks really cool. It looks pretty. So a game I've been looking at has a lot of hype is Beyond the Sun. That's by Dennis Chan. And the publisher is Rio Grande Games. It's because some hype you're basically collectively developing a, a tech tree. And it's not a co-op game, but you're sort of working together a little bit here, helping helping each other out occasionally with the intent of, you know, you're, there's only one sole winner. So I like that kind of feel in games where there's some helping each other out, but then you kind of just 
you only help your friends out as long as it's in your best interest. Then you kind of leave them behind. Sort of like real life. <laughs> like real, like real life. Like I treat, like I treat you guys. <laughs> so a lot of dice, a lot of stuff. I, it looks like a big old table hog. Um, I don't know, but I'm at least interested. I don't know if I'm totally looking forward to it, but you know, I want to learn a little more. There's some. Uh, there's a few in-depth reviews out there. Beyond the Sun. This is another Rio Grande game. Yeah, and Rio Grande's kind of known for your traditional i mean this you know underwater cities was uh produced at least in the united states it was brought in by rio grande but this is kind of the style of game you tend to get from rio grande which is you know your your classic euro game so do you get the impression that it it has that very euro feel and so it's not i don't get i get the impression that it's not your traditional euro feel um not like worker placement style or you know i need to look more into it but it has a lot of it's from what i understand it's just basically a gigantic tech tree mm. and you're choosing which branches of the tree to go down. Yeah. I'm looking at the board right now and that, that seems really cool. I love, I love it. I mean, <clears throat> this is like your, your classic tech trees is a fun mechanism, but I've, you know, that I've always, every time I've seen it in a game, it seems interesting, but the idea that it's a big shared one uh, like this. Yeah. It seems really neat. that would be interesting to find out more about it. When is that? Is that out now, or is that uh, coming out? Soon? Yeah, it's out now. You can but you can go buy it from local game stores. Having in stock, allegedly. Cool, cool. All right, right on. Well, sounds like some fun stuff coming up here. I think this time of year there tends to be a lot of uh, pretty neat titles um, out, and so uh, looking forward to getting some of these to the table. Well, I think that will wrap us up this week. Um, you can find us on Twitter at bg underscore hot takes on Facebook at Board Game Hot Takes and on BoardGameGeek.com under Guild 3804. Uh, if you can, please find us on um, Apple Podcasts and give us a review and, and give us a rating, hopefully all positive ones, but it will really help other people find us as well. So we'd appreciate that. Otherwise, tell us what you thought of our takes on the game we played today, and we'd love to hear from you. Until next week, take care, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.